May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Around ten years ago, my wife and I visited a little gospel chapel in the back streets of Swansea. On the outside, that humble chapel looked like many of the other crumbling remnants of the Welsh revival of years gone by. But on the inside, it was something quite different. For starters, I've never visited another place of worship where the first thing you see inside are instructions on how to treat trench foot. Zach's place, as the chapel is known, really is a place like no other. I was visiting because it's run by my dear friend Sean Stillman, the international president of the motorcycle club I belonged to for many years. A service at Zach's truly is like no other. A congregation made up of artists, bikers, and predominantly people experiencing homelessness, hence the Trenchford instructions. My desire for that day was to spend some time with Sean to see what I could learn from this remarkable ministry that might help shape my own growing sense of vocation. Back then, I made my living with a brick trowel, not a Bible. And I never dreamed of doing what I do now. While waiting for Sean, a confused and dishevelled man came shuffling in from the street outside. I tried to make him feel welcome and I offered him a cup of tea. He kept saying, where is Sean? I need to speak to Sean. I assured him that Sean was on his way and that maybe I might be able to help with whatever it was that he needed. No, I need Sean, the man kept saying. You can imagine my surprise when this wild-eyed gentleman that I'd been patronising so far, turned out to be the guest speaker at the chapel that evening. A missionary from Cambodia who ran a project rescuing sex workers. In the chaos of that service, my desire to hobnob with the leaders at Zach's place was transformed into the desire to belong to something like that remarkable chapel. Desire is a funny thing. The great theologians of the early church wrote a lot about desire. Leading Anglican theologian Sarah Coakley places desire not only at the centre of her theological work, but at the centre of the spiritual life too. For Coakley, our prayer lives, our discipleship and our ongoing conversion are all about having our desires desires, conformed to the desires of God. This gives us a different way to read verse 4 of the psalm, that God will give us the desires of our hearts. Of course, many people come to the Christian faith hoping to gain the desires of their hearts and they're eagerly encouraged by preachers of a prosperity gospel which promises wealth, health and power, all in exchange for a generous donation in the plate. But this type of Christianity is, of course, nothing more than a pyramid scheme. Many of the most faithful Christians I have met have had neither an abundance of power nor of wealth. Indeed, my own patron saint, St. Francis, saw voluntary poverty as a cornerstone of the spiritual life. (coughs) The psalmist promises that something special happens when our desires come into alignment with the desires of God. So what then are the desires of God which we must come into alignment with? It helps us to understand the context from which the psalmist writes. The wicked draw their bows to bring down the poor and the needy, delighting in their ill-gotten gains. 
The righteous, meanwhile, in his context, are generous and keep on giving. They utter wisdom and they speak of justice. The righteous are meek. Yet the meek are oppressed by the wicked, who tower over them like great trees, seeking to do them harm, to silence them. Well, it seems to me that the psalmist lived in times not entirely unlike the times we live in today. So what is God's desire in times like these? The psalmist makes it crystal clear in verse 28. The Lord loves justice. Justice is God's desire. Now I've found that I get very mixed reactions to preaching justice in these times of so-called culture war that we live in. Addressing injustice, oppression and ill-gotten wealth has led some to criticise me for, and I quote, jumping on the woke bandwagon or being another one of those terrible lefty priests. Well, I can reassure you that I am not here this evening to try to put the woke into Wokingham. <laughs> Neither will I be promoting party politics. It's been said that when the boot of oppression is on your neck, you care little for whether it is the right or the left foot inside it. Rather, what I believe that this psalm is getting at is something about this question of desire. This week I attended a lecture given by David Ford at King's College in London, who reminded us that the word translated as will in thy will be done might be better translated as desire. I wonder how might it change our prayer lives and our lives in general if we prayed every day, your kingdom come, your desire be done on earth as it is in heaven especially given our observation that what the Lord desires is justice. Justice, like desire, is another funny word. It's often spoken, but very rarely clarified. The best exposition of justice in the Judeo-Christian tradition that I have come across is in the words of Cornell West. Justice is what love looks like in public. Justice is what love looks like in public. Based on this measure, it seems clear to me from reading the daily news that we lack an abundance of justice in our public life. I wonder how our public life would look if it was centred not on scarcity, not on the desire for power, but on love. As the saying goes, those who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. The first epistle of Peter says, judgment starts with the house of God. Given that our own beloved church has been in the headlines again this week, maybe we could start off by asking, what would our church look like if it was centred, not on scarcity or the desire for power, but on love? I'm very fortunate that I get to spend a significant amount of my time working in the community in Bedford. And I find that the opinions that people out there, outside the church doors, have about the church, their opinions are quite fascinating. Many people I meet think the church only ever speaks of desire in negative terms. A favourite parishioner, and I know we're not supposed to have favourites, so I'm sorry, but a favourite parishioner of mine's son remarked recently after I visited their home, well, he wasn't really that bad for a priest. At least he didn't go on about sin the whole time he was here. My friends, the heart of God burns with a passionate desire for justice, for love in public. When we too become consumed by that same desire, people will remember what we are for at least as much as what we are against. That, for me, is the essence of meekness. The psalmist quoted by our Lord says that the meek shall inherit the earth. At that service at Zach's place all those years ago, I learned that meekness in the New Testament Greek 
was a military term to describe a horse that was so well trained it wouldn't become distracted or scared in battle. Meekness for us is having our eyes trained upon God's vision of love and justice for the world and our hearts set on fire with passion to get there. Not just for us, but for all of God's creation. If more people saw the church as focused on peace and justice, I think we'd find ourselves more relevant and having more in common with many of our neighbours. As former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, once wrote, the church exists to connect people at the level of their hunger for a new world. Meekness means being aligned with God's desire for the justice that is what love looks like in public. As I come to a close, it seems to me that we're living through a pivotal moment in the history of the Church of England. A chance to start dreaming and desiring for a new tomorrow, whether that's for better or for worse. So each one of us might like to ask, next time we sit down to pray, next time we're in PCC, next time we're looking for an opportunity to volunteer, God, what is your desire for my life? What is your desire for our parish? What is your desire for this community that we live in? And we might like to ask God to shape our own desires by his heart's desire. Crazy things can happen when meek people pray prayers like that and become consumed by God's desire for the places where they live. The meek turn things upside down. The hungry get fed. The lowly are lifted up. The stranger is welcomed. And sometimes, every once in a little while, Crumbling old chapels end up with instructions for treating Trenchfoot by the front door. I close with the words of a poem commissioned for an exhibition that was held at that little chapel in Swansea. It's called Meek Abundance by Stuart Henderson. How precise the fermentation and delicate the savour of meekness. Elixir of distilled strength and transparency. This slight fortune causes the bitter empires of passing Herods to rage and slay, as the meek, like lions disguised as butterflies, choose not to render in return. For to be meek is not to excel at appeasement, or to dissolve into muted compliance. Meekness, like justice, abides brooding with charity, counting the certain steps of the approaching pure day. Beware the meek, they have supped the crystal chalice, and even when they are disappeared and thought extinct, they return complete with perpetual joy, their speech succinct. Amen.